ESF is the oldest, largest, and most distinguished institution in the United States that is focused on the study of natural resources and the environment. Hello and welcome to this edition of Improve Your World with SUNY ESF. I'm Dave White. Today's program focuses on research efforts to bring back the American chestnut tree a tree devastated by blight at the turn of the last century. Scientists believe they are very close to a solution. We've been working on this for a long time. We've been studying this one particular gene, the oxide oxidase gene, and um, over the years it's really convinced me that this is the gene that's going to really do the trick. Um, for one thing, we've put this gene into hybrid poplar over 10 years ago, and we've shown in transgenic hybrid poplar that we can enhance uh, pathogen resistance in that tree. That was to a different pathogen, but it's still giving us evidence that it would work in our tree also. Well, people have been working ever since the discovery of the blight. People, we're about the third generation of scientists that have spent their careers investing in figuring out some way to get around the blight, avoid the blight, find something that was resistant to the blight, or some way solve the problem. And uh, so we're, we're hoping that ours is the generation that will, uh, that will succeed. This was a key species in the eastern forest. It was super productive at producing nuts for wildlife, very important for agriculture, for, for human uh, consumption of the nuts, very important for the lumber industry, making a very rot-resistant, fast-growing uh, uh, wood product. It, well, first off, one out of four trees in the eastern United States was the American chestnut when, in 1904 when the blight was discovered. So it was a hugely, just it, from physical presence, it was a huge tree uh, dominated the overstory in most of the eastern United States, uh, especially in the Appalachian Range. In fact, in the Appalachia, um, people used to release their hogs in the forest in the um, fall to fatten up for the uh, uh, winter time. It was important for the nut crop, was important for wildlife. Many wildlife populations crashed after the uh, chestnut disappeared out of the forest. Uh, it was a very reliable species. It produces a nut crop almost every season. Oak trees and other, uh, other things that came in to replace it were more uh, periodic. They would have a, a nut crop every three or four years. And that, that's not good if you're a wildlife going into the winter. So it was tremendously important for wildlife. It was tremendously important for the, the people in the region. Uh, American chestnut has been uh, uh, immortalized in, in song. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire, or you know the village blacksmith, um, you know under the spreading chestnut tree, the village blacksmith stands in books and stuff. Walden, uh, Thoreau's book, uh, he mentions chestnuts in there, and it's a very nice passage in there about American chestnut. So we really want to bring it back, and the only way you can come back is to make a resistant tree, because you cannot control blight any other way but making a resistant tree. And so once we have a resistant tree, we'll start a, a major restoration program, and it'll take time. It's going to actually take probably over 100 years to get it really established throughout its natural range. But we have to start somewhere, and uh, that's where we are right now at the beginnings. How did the American chestnut tree get into this position? It's a tale often told about a foreign species of plant brought into the country by accident or before people understood the dreadful, unintended consequences. We don't have the chestnut the way we used to because of a exotic pathogen that was introduced into this country about a little over 100 years ago. And um, when that came in, um, it was brought in on Asian species of the chestnut. And our American chestnut was not resistant at all to this particular uh, disease. And so it quickly swept through the uh, forests, uh, spreading within 50 years, killing over 3 billion uh, mature American chestnut trees. And today, American chestnut is pretty much just surviving as a small understory tree, a few million uh, left out of the billions that there once was. And we would like to restore it back to its grandeur. So this is a culture of Cryponectra parasitica. It's the fungus that causes chestnut blight. And it's the fungus that was brought in from Asia and is basically wiping out the American chestnut trees. Uh, this fungus will enter a wound in the bark of the chestnut. It will colonize that wound and eventually start producing um, oxalic acid and mycelial fans. And once those are formed, it starts invading the healthy tissue of the chestnut, uh, forming what's called a canker. This is an example of the problem with the uh, chestnut blight. Um, these are cankers formed by the fungus. Um, they enter through a wound and eventually form this canker. These things eventually will grow and girdle the tree, killing everything above it. Meanwhile, the uh, canidia or the spores spread down the tree, 
form other cankers until finally the base gets girdled and kills the whole tree above the ground. And basically that's how chestnuts are surviving today at the ground level. They will send up new sprouts, but if you can see even here, they get little cankers on them and those eventually die too. That's why you can't find big chestnuts anymore. Um, none of the big eight to uh, 10 foot diameter tri trees anymore. It's, it's all little, little trees like this. Uh, this is part of the creative project that I assigned in general chemistry to allow students to offset their exam grades with um, different, doing things that are creative in their field. They have to investigate the chemistry beyond that. Uh, Mike and I chose to do the picnic table because we uh, both find an interest in construction, being construction management majors, and both like woodworking and thought it was a great opportunity to jump a little bit into our field and find something we have some interest in. What I did was I etched in all the different letters for the elements and then I used a router and then um, carved out those shapes into the wood. So I, I just made like the H, so the two lines and then etched it out and just cut it out perfectly. The significance as we wrote about in our paper was um, how some of the stain stains into the table. Uh, we went a little bit in depth of the structure of the wood itself, some of the physical properties wood has. Um, things along those lines, the polyurethane that we put over the top and kind of how everything comes together to make it one final nice project. Um, one of the biggest things that we look at in our course is the fact that chemistry is everywhere and so I asked them to go out and have fun with chemistry and then to actually understand the processes, the reaction chemistry and so on. So the gentleman who um, produced the table that you see behind me um, looked at the polyurethane process, the drying process, the chemistry behind that, the different things that are in the woods that give them different colors and uh, their growth rates. Um, and so I assigned a kind of an open project this year because it is the International Year of Chemistry and um, it's also Centennial's year for ESF, so this makes it a nice kind of open-ended project. They could do whatever they wanted to do as long as it had chemistry and they could explain their chemistry afterwards. What have you got there? We got a table of cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, they smell good. I know. <laughs> Reiterating something Dr. Powell said earlier, the only way to bring back the American chestnut tree is to make one that's blight resistant because you cannot control blight any other way. So the only way back into the forest is through several different laboratories. First of all, we have to find um, some kind of gene that will confer resistance to American or to the chestnut blight, because um, the American chestnut tree has no resistance to blight. It never co-evolved with this; um, has no way to defend itself. So we've looked at many different sources of um, genes to put into the chestnut. One is from other plants. For example, um, we get um, a one of our first genes from uh, wheat. It encodes a enzyme called oxalate oxidase. And basically this gene will detoxify or break down an acid that the fungus throws at the plant. Okay, so the way this fungus attacks a plant, it produces oxalic acid, and that oxalic acid basically kills the plant cells. So we want to give the plant a defense against this acid. And we're not the only ones who are doing this. We're trying to put this into American chestnut. But a lot of other researchers are interested in putting this into other crops, such as peanut. And uh, they're using that to um, fight off diseases of peanut. People are also putting it into soybean. People are putting it into sunflower. People are putting it into tomato. And of course, we are putting it into chestnut. More recently, we started getting genes from Chinese chestnut. Now, Chinese chestnut is from a part of the world where this disease is um, endemic or is natural. And so the Chinese chestnut has co-evolved with this pathogen and therefore developed resistance on its own over long, long periods of time. So we are now just recently going into the Chinese chestnut genome and trying to pull out the genes that allow it to be resistant to chestnut blight. This is not an easy project to do. But we are looking at uh, several genes right now. We have about 30 of them from the Chinese chestnut that we are putting into American, and we're going to see if we can confer resistance with those genes. A lot of times people ask, how do you get a gene into a plant? Um, well, we don't directly put the gene into the plant. We actually have a natural genetic engineer that helps us. It's called Agrobacterium. 
a culture of Agrobacterium tumefaciens. It's a natural genetic engineer, and it's because of this um, we can put genes into the American chestnut. This uh, particular bacteria naturally puts uh, genes into plants. Usually in the wild it does the genes it wants to put in, but um, what we have done and other scientists have done is to um, put the genes we wanted to put into the chestnut tree uh, into it and then expose the chestnut um, cells to this bacteria and they will put it in for us. Right now she is transferring some embryos from American chestnut. These embryos are what we actually transform or put the gene into when we're putting genes into chestnut. And once we get them into these uh, embryos, we have to go through a long, long process, which you'll be seeing soon, uh, to get these embryos back into whole plants. But this is basically the starting uh, point. Using this microscope, we can have a good look at chestnut embryos that have had the enzyme from wheat genetically implanted. So what we have here is the incubator containing our embryos. Um, these different racks represent different uh, transformation experiments. Uh, and as you can see, we have a lot of them here. Uh, all these things are in the very early stages of um, the pipeline for developing uh, transgenic chestnut trees. All these will have to be regenerated into whole plants. So we see a lot of them here. We have right now what's called 130, we have 130 uh, events uh, in here. Each of those are going to be a different line of trees. In this lab, we're, we're responsible for getting from a um, little tiny embryo in a petri dish, a little green embryo, into a whole plant ready to go out into the field. And so it's, it's um, the embryos when they come out of Bill's lab, you've got a little, they're, they're tiny little things. They're about the size of a, of a pencil point. And um, the, many of them just, just refuse to regenerate into a whole plant. Uh, so we have maybe, uh, out of 200 that come over from Bill's lab, uh, we get maybe one, one shoot to, to form. Uh, um, so it takes a lot of embryos. So each of the different cell lines that he produces, he gives us maybe uh, two or four plates of, of embryos. We multiply them up from there. And then, then we put them into, um, into a, a different set of, of growth regulators and a different media. And we regenerate from that whole plant. We, uh, let's see, first we get shoots. We get multiple up the shoots until we got hundreds and hundreds of shoots, and then we we um, root those, and then we put those into the growth chamber, and eventually out into the greenhouse. It takes about just about uh, between the time it comes out of Bill's lab and we're ready to go into the field, it's just about a little over a year. This is what comes over from Dr. Powell's molecular biology lab. We get a little plate full of embryos that have got the new genes put in them, and the next step is we need to uh, we put them in, transfer them into a different media that encourages shoot production. And if you notice down here in this one little corner, there is one little shoot coming up out of all of these embryos. Hundreds and hundreds of these embryos out of, the, out of a petri dish like this, we might get one shoot, but that's all we need. Because once we've got one shoot, we're off and running. So this is where we do our propagation. This is what we use to grow our plants in. It's a gel kind of like jello with sugar and minerals and nutrients, everything that a plant needs to grow without soil. What we do every month or every three weeks is uh, take these cubes of plants. I'm going to pull a few out. This is a little baby chestnut. Okay. Cut off some of the big leaves. Cut off this base. This is callus. This is undifferentiated plant tissue. We don't want that. We just want the shoots. So we've got a little one over here. Cut off a couple more of these big leaves. Here's one right here. And there's another one. So in this case, <coughs> from one shoot, kind of on the smaller side, I got three new pieces which will all grow up to be nice big shoots from which I can chop all of those into more pieces. When we get these nice big shoots the other thing we can do is uh, start them getting, uh, convince them to get some roots. So it starts out the same where we cut off the base of callus at the bottom. Then we take the leaves off of the bottom third of the plant and make a little diagonal slice and place it in this 
uh, rooting hormone, which is called IBA for short. This is a plant hormone that stimulates root growth. Let them sit in the uh, hormone for about a minute. And then we use this special media here, which has a little bit of activated charcoal in it, which shades the roots and stimulates root growth as well. Then we take these and gently put them in the rooting media. Now this is about a week to 10 days later. They've come out of the rooting and they've gone into this uh, post-rooting media. And they've been doing very nicely. This is about a week later. You can see all the beautiful roots on the bottom. It took us years to be able to do that. And Allison is a master at it. So I have a little magenta cube with our TC plants. And I'm going to put them into potting soil. And I usually want to try to find one that has an alive shoot tip. Just take this one. So I just gently... Pull it out like that. And then I'm going to make a little hole in the potting soil. And gently pack it down around the roots. So it looks like that. Just going to water it a little bit. You might think the hard part is over. The tiny chestnut embryos are now tiny plants. They have roots. They are ready to grow into trees. Eh, not quite. The plants need a big assist, and that's delivered in the acclimatization laboratory. Uh, we've had this room for about uh, since 2007. It was purchased, we uh, split it with 50-50 with the American Chestnut Foundation, and the college picked up the tab for the other half. And it's just been a lifesaver. Before we had the, the facilities, I'll show you inside, we were killing off better than 95% of our plants before they got out to the field. We had roots on the bottom, we had little shoots, we'd work so terribly hard, but we'd kill off 95% of them on the way out the door. And uh, so uh, the Chestnut Foundation, uh, the president of the Chestnut Foundation came to me and said, Chuck, what can we do to help? And I said, well, you can buy us a couple of growth chambers. And he said, how much? And I said, oh, about 50,000 a pop. And he sort of blinked, but within six months he had the money and I had the, uh, the uh, we got the access to the room and we put it together and we've had this uh, ever since and it made a tremendous difference. So, problem solved. Not quite. Let's go back to lab technician Logan Will and watch her finish preparing the plants for the growth room. She puts a plastic bag over the baby plant and anchors it with a rubber band, which it turns out helps the program take a significant leap forward. So. That's it. The biggest problem with getting a tissue culture plant out to the ready to go outside is that the foliage, the leaves, are completely worthless. The stomates, uh, stomates are stuck in the open position. The cuticle layer is absent. So uh, a tissue culture plant will go from perfectly healthy in a, in, inside the cube where you've seen it to dead as a stone within 20 minutes. So we have to have some way of keeping it very, very moist so what I did, I called up all the growth chamber manufacturers and said, when I open these doors, I want to see fog roll out. They all told me they couldn't do that. So I finally agreed. One, one growth chamber manufacturer said he would strap on the biggest humidifier unit they make into the medium-sized chamber. He'd never done it before, but he sold us that way. And he thought he, thought he could get us 95% humidity. Now that's very, very humid. If you go out on a summer day and it's 95%, you are going to die. It's so humid. But if you're a little tissue culture plant, it still wasn't enough. So we had spent $50,000 each on these chambers and we still were killing off maybe 50, 75, 80% of the plants. So then one, somebody, we don't know who did, nobody can remember who came up with the bright idea. But So we spent $50,000 to get up to 95%. And then we spent another nickel and another nickel on a rubber band and a uh, Ziploc baggie to get up to high enough to where we could keep the plants alive. So that's what we do in here. We put uh, each of the little plants before it goes into the pot, gets one of these little plant, uh, gets a little plastic bag and a rubber band. And that made it, that made all the difference. And with this treatment, we can get probably 50 to 75% survival into the greenhouse, which is where we'll go next.
big ones, you got to dig a big enough hole. Uh, you always dig wide, not deep. Uh, it's much more important that you have at least at least twice the diameter of the uh, root ball that you're putting in the ground. You should have a hole at least twice. And sometimes in, in heavy clay soils, you want at least three times that diameter. You feel ridiculous when you dig this. You get a wide hole about the size of a bathtub. You put in this relatively small tree, but it really makes a big difference. That tells you how deep you want it. We're just, geez, we're just about there. Good Lord. You've got to have the roots so they're right at the surface when you're finally finished and the, the ground is settling and uh, the tree is uh, in its final position. The, the topmost root should be right, right at or even just slightly above the surface of the soil. I've seen uh, trees planted with huge augers. It slicks up the sides of the hole and those roots will grow, grow out to that point and then they won't penetrate into the original soil. If you slant the sides of the hole, you have what's called a rain gauge effect where you've got the, the outside of the hole it collects water, so it puddles down in the bottom. You can drown your tree. You can either double or half the life of a tree on the day you plant it. All right, we're in the ESF greenhouse. This is the next stop after the growth chamber. Uh, so trees come out of the growth chamber, tiny, inch or so tall, tiny leaves. And this is kind of the next step in acclimatization where they're starting to look more like real trees, what we recognize as trees. So after they've been in here a couple months, they'll start getting bigger leaves, start getting a little taller, and in another couple months, we'll be able to plant them outside. So if you look over here, um, these trees that are planted close together in the uh, tree tubes, this is our efforts to figure out how to uh, upscale uh, production of these trees. This is a, a simulated seed bed, even though these do come from tissue culture, not from seed. Um, planting them on very close uh, intervals, and during the summer, we actually have a shade tent that goes over top that. So every tube has a, a tree in it. The tubes help them to uh, start off nice and straight and uh, protect them from rodents and things like that. So these are the trees that come right out of the greenhouse, uh, grow for a season or two uh, in close quarters, and then we would dig them up probably bare root them and, and move them to other, other places. In fact, I think a couple of these trees in this will be the ones that go to the uh, New York Botanical Garden. That's right. Dr. Powell said transgenic American chestnut trees are planted in New York City. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, a little more on the science at work here. The first step of the RNA extraction is to grind up the plant tissue uh, to a fine powder. And we do that using a mortar and pestle and liquid nitrogen. And you can see we have a, the leaf is all ground up to a nice fine powder. In this procedure, lab technician Kathleen Baer is extracting RNA from genetically modified shoots so their gene expression can be examined. The powder is put in a solution and the RNA extracted for analysis. And this is one of the ways we analyze that RNA, to look at uh, the genes that we've put in and how they're actually responding inside the plant. Put the RNA in this machine and this display shows uh, different amounts of expression. In other words, how effective is each gene at affecting changes in the new chestnut tree? Farther along in the growing process, a leaf assay is performed. This is a way to uh, predict how the trees are going to react to the chestnut blight, but a test that we can do earlier on in the process. Um, so instead of inoculating a tree uh, when it's maybe five years old outside, we can take a leaf off a tree that's much younger and uh, test it with some of the blight fungus to see how it's going to respond. I'm going to start by making a wound on the mid vein of the leaf. I'm going to use a scalpel and just make a tiny slit uh, along the mid vein here. This simulates a wound that would happen on the bark of the tree. Next I'm going to take a, a plug of the blight fungus that we've cultured in the lab. So I have a little round plug here that I just cut. And I'm going to put that so the fungus is right against the wound. And then after the leaf has been exposed to the fungus like this, we'll put it in a tray that will keep it moist. Cover that, seal it up, and store it in the dark for about one week. After this week, 
there will be a staining that will appear next to the wound that I created. And based on how much of the leaf is stained, we'll, we'll be able to predict how uh, that tree will respond to the blight in more natural uh, situations. Now just recently, we had um, some transgenic uh, trees made that produce large amounts of this enzyme. And what we found is if you reach a certain point with this, amount, with this enzyme, um, you get a great inhibition of the fungus on our leaf assays. Okay, so we have at least five lines right now or more that are looking very, very good for resistance. Now saying that, the caveat is that we don't know for sure until these trees reach uh, three to four years old. That's when we will test them. And uh, they might be fully resistant or they might be partially resistant. If they're partially resistant, the great thing is, is that we are looking at lots and lots of other genes that we can stack with this uh, oxide oxidase gene. And with the combinations, we might reach the, the full resistance and have a restoration tree. But it could be this gene by itself, and well, we will see. They were confident enough in these five lines of trees to accept an invitation from the New York Botanical Garden in New York City to put in a test plot in a very significant location. We're, we're very excited to be going back to the New York Botanical Garden because that's a stone's throw, right, at, right literally across the street from where the blight was discovered in 1904. And so we're, it's, just, it's just such a full circle effect that it's just, just uh, very exciting to us. It's a chance for Drs. Powell and Maynard to update many of the people and organizations that have helped fund the research. Many of you um, were involved with this project from the get-go. Many of you made major contributions along the way. Uh, this, this is like old home. This is just crazy. Uh, art of genetic engineering was very new when we started. There was only a handful of plants that had been genetically engineered, and only one tree. Following their lecture, everyone gathered at the test site to plant the last of the 10 trees at this site and a chance for some of the laboratory staff to join in the celebration. The building evidence over time has finally got to a point where I think um, we can be pretty confident with these trees. Again, I can't guarantee it, but I think we have um, high confidence that these will, um, well, I'm almost certain that these will have enhanced resistance. The question is, will it be a high enough resistance that we want to use in a restoration program? If it's high enough, we will immediately go into that. If it's not high enough, we will continue to add additional genes until we get to the level that it can go into restoration. That's it for this edition of Improve Your World with SUNY ESF. Please join us again next time.